welcome back. Very, very peaceful people. You need to be very peaceful this morning because we have, I guess it's safe. The kids are out. It's kind of an R-rated text today. Just to warn you. We're not going to let, it, the, tense, the text is offensive. We're going to just let the offense be. I hope you're okay. Our guests, I'm not sure it was the best Sunday to be here with us. <laughs> I think I'm about to preach the most offensive sermon ever. But uh, just to warn you, we're, just, we're going to just go through the text. But um, It is a long text. We're wrapping up Revelation. We've been here since the beginning of Advent. So, so we've been in it a long time. And it's been all about the Lamb. And today it's about the Lamb's economics. So... Because it's a long text, we're going to read, Miriam's going to read, and Faith is going to read. So you guys come on up here and lead us, and the, you'll, the bold part is our bit. Shall we stand yet and read the text? That might be a good idea. One of the seven angels came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and out of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw? Where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. I am not a widow, I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon! In one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. Fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth. Every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense. Of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat. Cattle and sheep, horses and carriages. And human beings sold as slaves. They will say, all your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. 
The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea, will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will explain, Was there, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters, will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never <coughs> shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people and of all who have been murdered on the earth. After this, I heard what sounded like a roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. Thank you. You may be seated. The fastest growing criminal industry in the world is also the world's oldest, you know what it is, human trafficking. Here in Vancouver, one girl can earn a pimp $300,000 a year easily. Girls and young women from all socioeconomic backgrounds get hunted in our malls, coffee shops, movie theaters, outside our schools, and increasingly online. Many girls are also brought here to Vancouver from across the sea, captured by force or lured by the promise of a much better life. They arrive here, here in our city, knowing no one but their captors, possessing nothing but what they've been given by their captors. They're threatened, beaten, drugged, raped. They're sent out on our streets. In Anti Wright's words, there are new slaves, frightened, shocked, horribly abused. Their physical bruises only a pale indication of the mental and the emotional bruising inside. They're the new prostitutes, today's new breed of whore. Now, whore is a horrible word. I'm going to let it sit because that's actually the word in the text. We've kind of changed it to prostitute because it doesn't sound quite so bad. I'm going to just let the offensive words fall and you'll understand why. But these prostitutes, as their bodies become more beaten up, ragged, and chemically addicted, many of them end up finally right here on our streets, right outside here um, on the downtown east side. I watched the Johns coming and going next door um, on what we call here a women's shelter. It's not always. Take a moment some time I, and stop and sometimes I think you should invite one of these precious women on our streets out for lunch. If you're a woman, I think, maybe, or you can do it as a couple. Um, listen to her story. It can't help but break your heart. Of course, prostitution is not a modern woe. Sex slaves were common in the ancient world too especially in wealthy Rome. It was Rome's and it's now ours. It's Vancouver's dirty little secret. We try to pretend that it's not that big a problem. It is, and it's growing. 
Now, there was also a very different kind of whore in John's day and still in ours today. More visible, more socially accepted, the professional prostitute, the courtesan, the, the high-profile escort. Young women and young men, not in any way coerced to sell themselves, but who've discovered a quick way to make a bundle of cash. Play your cards right, you get the high life. You get to wear Armani or uh, Versace gowns, draped in glittering jewels. You get to be the gorgeous young escort at a society ball, photographed on the arm of one of the world's you know, important or powerful people. It soon goes sour, but for a while, the dream looks good. There's even been this seriously disturbing trend recently of young women offering up or selling their virginity on eBay. Uh, or another platform, some for upwards of one million dollars, or even more. Now, that second, that's a class of harlot or prostitute that John is describing up here. Just, we need to kind of get that straight here, first of all. It, metaphor, metaphor you'll see, but he's thinking that way. She thinks she's at the top of the world. Back in chapter two, called Jezebel, remember the kind of prostitute queen mistress of Ahab, who um, took all of Israel down her idolatrous path. She wants her, us to join her, this one. This rich prostitute holds out toward us this wondrous golden goblet. Remember reading about that one? Enticing us to the banquet of our lives. But, says John, the writer of the apocalypse, beware. Watch out. Inside that goblet, 17 verse 4, the abominable filth of her fornications, literally. We read that and we're like, all right, guess we shouldn't drink that. No, actually, it's filth. You're meant to flinch. You're meant to gag when you read that. Inside that cup, a froth of urine, feces, coagulated blood. You're really going to swallow that putrid, foaming, stomach churning sewage? Why am I being so gross? Because we don't get it. The whore has seduced and enticed us all. We're already drinking that stuff. We are drinking it. We're already in bed with the whore, John says. Come out, John screeches in 18 verse 4. Come out of her, my people, so you don't share in her sins. Yeah, that's blunt. That is intentionally offensive sexual language. Get out, come out and run. Now the big question for us this morning is easy. How do we do that? How do we pull out? How do we come out of the prostitute? But before we can ask how, we need to ask why. Right? Why is it so important that we get out of bed with the great prostitute? But before we can ask why, we need to ask who. Who is this prostitute? Who, then when, then why? Oh, how? Who, then when, why? Let me get that right. Who, <laughs> who, why, how? Yes, that. Three questions this morning. And finally, I promise we will end with good news. Right, so first, who is the great prostitute? That first question is easy. Easy est, at least. The text is so specific, it tells us. It's emblazoned in these big letters across the prostitute's forehead, 17.5. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes. The prostitute is a city. The great ancient city, Babylon. Wait, wait. But Babylon's been a heap of ruins for centuries by this point. How can it be Babylon? Verse 18. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. I just want to say I've given Phil quite a task because I'm putting up the text because I'm going to go pretty quickly this morning. So bless you, Phil. You'll do a great job. I know you're doing a great job. I'm not going to even follow to see if you're doing a great job. You always do. All right. The city that rules over the kings of the earth. You know who that is. That's Rome. It's got to be, right? Verse 3. 
the woman rides the scarlet beast with the seven heads. And just in case there's any doubt, verse 9. Those seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sits. Even today, Rome's still known as the city on seven hills, right? Google it. So, the great empire Rome was a monstrous whore. That's his point. Not a literal woman. It's a city. And it's Rome. And he says mystery because he's kind of saying connect the dots because Rome already really hates John, doesn't like John. But what does that have to do with us today? Hmm? Well, actually, remember verse 5? She is the mother of prostitutes. Rome's going to be spawning lots of other prostitutes, having lots of prostitute babies who still ride the beast. There is a powerful, the oppressive British Empire okay, on whom the sun and slavery never sat. Then there is Genghis Khan's powerful and brutal empire. There is a, pr a present American empire, and there's lots of others. That prostitute is still with us, bigger and more seductive and enticing than ever, still riding the beast. You want to buy or sell? Get the mark of the beast. It's the only way. Want to be wealthy? Want to power, fame, fun, the good life? Then you've got to get in bed with a whore. That's what we're told. Who is this beast? Well, we didn't get to spend a lot of time back in chapter 13 back last week, did we? So maybe you can go back and look at it, or you can just take my word for it. It's the whole military, political, powerful system of empire. It's the empire system. It's economic power. It's that whole military-industrial complex that President Eisenhower so famously warned us against. By the way, you can look up military-industrial complex as well in Google or, or Wikipedia. Too. There they call it the beast, behemoth, which is an ancient beast that comes up in Job. But he took it from the pagan sources. All right, that's enough who for now. The who will become even clearer as we look at question number two, why? Why get out of bed with Rome? Why run from the seductions of the beast and the enticing wiles of the prostitute? So number two, why is it so important we come out of the whore? Lots of reasons, I, gotta, I can only take, give you four this morning. So first one, because the prostitute, this prostitute is going down. Just think about this a moment. John is a political exile. He has run afoul this monstrous fucker. He's the only apostle Rome has not yet martyred at this point. He is exiled on that lonely island of Patmos. Remember chapter 1? What does he do? He writes a lament for Rome. Look carefully at Revelation chapter 18 again. What is this? This is a funeral dirge. He's writing Rome's funeral song. It's amazing. For this beautiful, gaudy, jewel-bedecked, violent, seductive whore, little bitty John intones a funeral dirge for gargantuan... How do you say that? Gargantuan? Gargantuan. 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 Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't even try. Rome. <laughs> Talk about spunky. Right? Talk about fearless, audacious of John to do this. 18 verse 2. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit. A haunt for every unclean bird. A haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. Notice how John speaks in past tense. Did you see that? Rome does survive another 300 years but she is going down. She's as good as over. How have the mighty fallen, rotten to the core? There is no doubt Rome's doom is sealed. No doubt. How can John be so sure? Because he knows evil self-destructs. Evil is self-cannibalistic. The beast turns on the whore, 17.6. 
The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Remember, this is one system. It's a message that keeps getting repeated over and over again in all sorts of sources. Evil self-destructs. You saw that. Those who destroy the earth are destroying themselves. We saw that last week. We know that in so many ways just now with the whole ecological crisis. In ancient and Egyptian, sorry, in, in ancient Egyptian and Greek mythology, and even in Old Norse mythology, the great serpent dragon eats its own tail. There's a reason. There's a reason that politicians and economists especially are known as backstabbers. Right? They're kind of infamous for that. It kind of goes with the whole beastly world system. All right, here's another reason why we really need to leave the whore. Because the prostitute is idolatrous and arrogant. Listen to these descriptions of Harlot City, Rome. There's a key word here. See if you can identify it up here. 17.1, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. 17.5, the name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes. 18.2, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. 18.10, and in verses 16 and 19, woe, woe to you. The merchants, by the way, the merchants, the traders, or the sailors, and the kings all say the same thing. Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city, Babylon. 18.18, was there ever a city like this great city? The great city of Babylon will be thrown down. And finally, one more here. Hallelujah, God has condemned the great prostitute. What's the, what's the key word? Great, yes, it's great. This is a city that still lays claim to being the eternal city. Even today, it was called that 2,000 years ago. Great prostitute, great city. You know, the current slogan, it's no coincidence. It's no accident. Make America great again. Just another prostitute. Just another arrogant, idolatrous city. One of the clearest expressions of our idolatry is the way that we worship the economy as God. Just try to suggest that the economy should not keep expanding forever, that we actually live in a limited system, that we actually aren't eternal on earth here. And watch the horror on people's faces. Heresy, they hiss. For the sake of the economy, we are willing to sacrifice even our own kids to the great empire. It's true. We consume, we devour, we cannibalize our own kids for the sake of the economy. We're offering them up on the altar of our extravagant lifestyles. Matthew once said to me recently, we're burning our future as fuel. He was trying to encourage me not to. Right? Fossil fuel. The future of our kids. We're burning it as fuel. And that brings us to another reason why we must leave the prostitute. Because she's oppressive. She's addictive, violent, exploitive. Now, it's no secret how addictive sex can be. How enslaving it can be. I can't tell you how many people I know mostly men, it seems, who've thrown away just about everything. Their honor, their decades-long marriage, their family, their career. Some have even thrown away their health for a fling, for a sexual experience. Smart men. You know, people that you just, what are you doing? The inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. We know that sex and love should go together, like pie and ice cream, right? But prostitution is just the opposite. Far too frequently, it's sex and injustice that's connected. A hip, literally. Sex and utter intimacy belong together. Prostitution is sex that's utterly divorced from intimacy. Sex on a budget, bargain sex, market sex, sex economy. Of course the sex tree, it's got to be violent. It's got to be oppressive against the weak. Often, that's women. I, I could give you even a little great example because I'm talking things, you go, oh, you know, not me. <laughs> I hope this isn't you either, by the way. I have two friends on Facebook currently cashing in on their friends through, guess what? 
you know what it is because you might have one of these multi-level marketing promotions, right? Sorry? Okay. Ponzi. Ponzi. I can, yes, that's right. Like a, a pyramid scheme. Ponzi. <laughs> pyramid scheme. Yes. Um, every post I see from my friends, I don't think you'll ever see who they are, so I can say this. But how do I feel? I'm violated. Our relationship is being commodified. Worse, it's being degraded, polluted. My friendship is their business opportunity. Potential for profit. How do I feel? I feel objectified. I feel manipulated. I feel exploited. I bet you do too. With those... But the point is, how much more exploitive than this imperial prostitute Rome? Now, notice all the resources that Rome is vacuuming, sucking in. Great vacuum cleaner Rome. Did you count the number, by the way, as they were read? Guess how many there are. You can guess. You already know. No? 28. 28. Seven times four, like there's lots and lots of other 28s in the Revelation, because four and seven mean something. It's a remarkable catalog here for many reasons. For one, it's by far the longest list of commodities and imports to Rome in any of the lists of ancient literature. Isn't that interesting? Rome, I mean, this little book of Revelation gets it. it, it the prize for the longest list. There's more commodities, but it's the longest. All 28 commodities also travel in one direction and one direction only. Rome's only export is, guess what? What do you think it is? Money? Military. military. Yeah. yeah, it's its military might that it exports. The four horrible horses of the apocalypse, conquest, war, famine, starvation, and all of that stuff. That's what Rome exports. One with, what did I miss? A disease. Well, I guess Rome exported that too. Uh, lots of disease came out of there. Notice the first on the list, gold. I can't go through all 28 or you'll be here way too long, but I'm going to pick a few. Gold. Rome conquered and slaughtered viciously for gold. Rome expropriated most of Spain's uh, gold mines in the first century here, uh, at around this time. Made them state pro property by highly dubious means of confiscation. You Eumolpus says, if there were any land that promised a, a yield of yellow gold, that place was Rome's enemy. Fate stood ready for the sorrows of war, for the four horrible horses of the apocalypse. And the quest for wealth, he didn't say that, I added that in, by the way. And the quest for wealth went on, end of quote. Now, way down this list is a basic necessity. Surely it's okay to import wheat. Rome was this incredible mega city, population of very close to maybe even over one million people. The largest city in the ancient world by an enormous margin. The next city to make one million was, guess what city? Anybody know? In the 18th century. London, yeah. Finally in the 18th century. So there's thousands of ships loaded with wheat crossing the Mediterranean to Rome from Egypt, from Africa, from Asia. In fact, we know Paul came across in one of those, but it was shipwrecked. Remember, it lost its load of wheat on the way over in that great storm. Food riots were commonplace, rocked the ancient world in places like Ephesus and Laodicea and Thyatira. Why? Because all the wheat was heading to Rome and local populations were starving whenever there was a bad crop bad harvest because Rome had to eat. Remember the third horse of the apocalypse? Lots of foodstuffs. Remember that? Or, sorry, lots of luxurious foodstuffs. Lots of, remember, oil and wine. But starvation with the wheat. Not enough wheat. John knew what he's talking about. At the climax of the list, Literally, the bodies of slaves. Oh, I, oh, yeah, there it is. The bodies of slaves. But then John tacks on this line, remember, they're human souls, not just bodies. It's how God sees us all. Human souls. So 50% of Rome's population, every, half of the population of Rome, 
Around 500,000 souls were slaves. Most of them were prisoners of war, conquered and shipped from the battlefront to Rome to keep her economic engine chugging along. In fact, one of the main reasons scholars say that the Roman Empire eventually crumbled was that the source of slaves dried up because Rome was no longer conquering uh, new lands. And so its economy fell into tatters, not enough replacement slaves. But when John writes, there is a steady steam, stream of slaves pouring into Rome from faraway battlefronts, and a lot of them would have been funneled through the great port of, do you know which one? Where John was the pastor? Ephesus, the, the city at the head of the seven cities. So flowing through the Ephesus port would have been tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of slaves. In his mind's eye, John sees these souls cowering at the auction block. Husbands sold to this person, wife sold over that person, a beautiful young daughter to this old, seedy, smirking old man, strong son to the owner of a brutal, life-reducing mine. People didn't live very long in the mines. Rome's economy rotten, decadent to the core. That's the final why we should come out of the war. Because the, she is filthy decadent. Rome was absolutely obsessed with an insatiable desire for its filthy opulence. Again, if we had time to go over those 28 commodities on that list, all pouring in one direction, you would see how the Romans' own accounts of their obsessive consumption, Roman historians themselves, they, they talk about it and they bewail it and they say, we're crazy. But it's matched only by Rome, present day, disordered, our manic impulses to consume, 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 it's crazy. Just one item, of marble, Caesar Augustus, remember him? The emperor at the time of, you guys know? Yeah, at the time of Jesus' birth, right? The days of Caesar Augustus. Emperor when Jesus was born, he famously boasted, I found Rome brick, I left her marble, he said. One more, yeah, ivory. Did you know that there used to be three species of elephants? Not just Asian and African, there's also a Syrian species. Syrian elephants. The Roman addiction to ivory wiped them into extinction about a hundred years before Jesus was born. And also seriously depleted the other elephants in all the accessible regions of Northern Africa. They just couldn't get to the other elephants. That's why they didn't die. Listen to John's stinging critique, his judgment on Rome's excess, on her decadence, her luxury, at such a terrible cost to everybody else. 17.4. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with the abominable filth of her adulteries. 18.3, all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. 18.7, give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. Right, like Jezebel we're supposed to remember. I am not a widow, I will never mourn. 18.9, when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they're going to weep and they're going to mourn over her. She doesn't make them lots of money anymore. 18.14, all your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry, woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen. Do you know how much it cost to make purple and what they had to do? Look it up sometime. Purple, scarlet, glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such a great wealth has been brought to ruin. Listen, do you get it? We, we are Babylon. It's us. That's what we've got to remember. Are we not living in the belly of the beast? Are we not the merchants, the kings of the earth who profit from all of this prostitution? It's got to be written for us. It's us. 
if it was Rome, it's surely us. I cannot see how we are not totally in bed with the whore. If God's judgment is to fall on Rome, what about us? What about the modern great Babylon whore? That's the point. So finally, our third question for this morning. Speed along here. How can we leave the brothel? How indeed? Again, lots and lots of ways, but here's a starting list. Stop consuming. How about we try to break our addiction to consumption for, for just a week? Don't buy anything for a week. Load your compass card, then pack your lunch, make your own coffee, no purchase, no cannibalizing creation for just one week. Try it. You know, that's one of the steps to breaking addictions is just taking a break. Do you know what they do with our throwaway electronics? How poisonous they are? Do you know? Or how about our credit card debt? That's devouring our own tail, if anything is. How can we help each other then to break our addictions to the beast? Stop compromising. Another one. Again, I want you to notice a trap that John has sprung in his seven churches. A lot of them are feeling, oh, poor me, we are under the oppression of the beast. Everyone agrees, Rome is corrupt, polluting, beastly Babylon. Oh, but wait, Rome is also a seductive, alluring, enticing courtesan. Look how rich she makes the merchants, and the traders, and the shippers. And there's lots of wealthy people in Ephesus, Thyatira, Pergamum, Laodicea, who are caught up in this escort's seductive web. And we read in chapters 2 and 3 that there's Christians who are all part of that whole system too. There are a lot of Christians that are pretty wealthy in those cities. We know that some of those Christians were struggling mightily with compromise. Remember the Nicolaitans in chapter 2? They were making lots of excuses for getting in bed with Rome. It's not wrong to be rich, you know? You can't leave the world, you know? Shrink the economy? Are you crazy? Again, Jezebel in chapter 2. Not the literal Jezebel. That was back in the Old Testament. Not the ancient gaudy mistress queen Fluzy of uh, King Ahab's who seduced the entire nation of Israel with her sexy baubles and trinkets. You get the picture. We're just like those seven churches. We too let ourselves get seduced and enticed and sucked in. We too fawn over the world's wealthy, don't we? We want to get close to them. We would love some of their wealth and their shininess and their power and their sparkliness to rub off on us. Come out, yells John. Come out. The beast's economy is killing us. How else can we come out? Humble ourselves. Maybe we could look for a demotion rather than a promotion. Get smaller. How can we live unless? How can I stop fawning over the world's beautiful, powerful people? Stop longing for their crazy rich lives. How can I be content and love the beautiful little people and the little things? How can I start to believe it's really the meek who are blessed? It's the meek who inherit the earth. They get to inherit the earth. Who are the meek? How else can we leave the belly of the beast? Pursue justice. John's <laughs> blunt about this prostitute's oppression. She is drunk on the blood of the saints. She's so cruel to those who are really willing to follow Jesus. They get her full wrath. But notice... John's not merely ranting against the persecution of Christians. He is concerned for the justice of all victims. I think there's a really important line here. He speaks out for all the innocent, all the victims whom this beastly prostitute gobbles up, murders. Christian merchants, traitors, us. Compromisers, benefactors of the empire. That's us. It's time for us to disengage, to seek justice, to stand with the poor, the vulnerable, those the beast gobbles up. And then there's one final how. It's the good news finally. Join the bride. Build New Jerusalem. Build New Jerusalem. 
Once again, I wish we had the time to see how the gentle lamb contrasts brilliantly with the ghastly beast. How the beautiful New Jerusalem contrasts with cruel, great Babylon. How the radiant bride of the lamb contrasts with this garish prostitute. By the way, you could just read those last few chapters and do that. Make, you know, kind of compare those two. But time to go straight to our conclusion here. Tale of two cities. New Jerusalem is utterly different. Utterly opposite, decadent. Babylon. In God's holy city, every tear gets wiped away from their from every eye. All that pain and sorrow and tears caused by tyranny and brutality and oppressive injustice in Babylon, it says it gets healed, gets transformed in New Jerusalem. So, come in is the call in chapter in chapter 22. Come enter New Jerusalem. There's no economy here. Here it's prosperity for all, not massive luxury and opulence for a few with starvation scarcity for all the rest, like prostitute Babylon. Enough, there's enough. There's even abundance for all in New Jerusalem. Please notice that New Jerusalem's rejection of the idolatry of excess the idolatry of infinite expansion of the economy is not the rejection of flourishing, not the rejection of the growth and human culture. There's a tree of life there. 2124, the nations will walk by the light of the Lamb who illuminates all of New Jerusalem. There's no sun there. Kings of the earth bring their splendor into it. Notice, human culture is valued here. Human culture is all the nations, not just Rome's kind of mick empire culture. All nations get to bring their glory into New Jerusalem. It's not the rejection of beauty, but real beauty. Not the gaudy baubles and the trinkets of the whore. The tree of life with this glorious fruit that's like jewels. That heals not just souls, not, not even just people. Right? This is healing of the nations. That's, a, that's an amazing vision. This is the healing of the nations. Freely, not forced, not coerced, not, not intimacy at a price. Right? This is lavish, real lavish. Abundant, but not excessive. Enough for everyone, not destructive. The healing of the nations, not the curse. No longer will there be any curse. And so our apocalypse concludes in chapter 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say come. That's the last word. Let everyone who hears say come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life come and drink freely and eat the fruit that heals and doesn't destroy. Isn't that good news? <laughs> All right, we made it through. I've always given you a bit of time in Revelation and this. I've got to give you a couple minutes yet for Q&A. If you have anything you're wondering about or anything like, man, you're way too hard on North America. And us here, you know, you're for, and everybody who participates in the beast. Because by the way, the nations are, I mean, Ephesus and Thyatira and Laodicea, they're all over the place, right? We've, Rome's just expanded its, its reach all over the world. Comments, questions? And then I'm going to pray with you, and then we'll respond with, take my life and let it be. You feel kind of beaten down? Mm-hmm. Revelation 17, 18, and 19. Did, didn't that, uh, the description of the kingdom of Jerusalem in the end, where all the nations bring their splendor into it, that rang awfully similar to Rome, dragging, like sucking all the, all the resources from Right. Around it. That sounds right. awfully similar, just the rebranding. Interesting. So you think, is this really, is this just another Rome? Yeah. But look at how it's freely, freely, and it's give. It's this out goes. The river of life flows out, out for the healing of the nations. The trees for, in all 12 seasons, fruit for all the nations. It's always outward flowing. Like New Jerusalem gives, it doesn't suck in. All the language of chapters 21 and 22 is this kind of outflow. And that's why we've got to quit being a social club, or not. We talked about it last night. We had this great, 
great uh, group together last night. We talked about hospitality, and we kind of, and uh, yeah, we talked about how can we be this outward turned. So yeah, there's parallels. That's my point, right? You're going to see all this. New Jerusalem, Babylon tries to imitate New Jerusalem, but it's this great vacuum. That's us. You know how much more? How many, how many earths would we need if we all, everybody consumed what an or, ordinary Canadian consumes? You know how many earths? Seven. Is it seven? Okay, I heard four, but seven. Are we taking more than we deserve? Perfect number. Seven times four. One day it'll be 28. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hopefully not. Because we can't, you can't sustain that. Other people have to be poor and live on, and, and there's starvation. Madagascar, did you know that the people of Madagascar, many, many people died of starvation this year? Partly due to global warming. Mm. Okay. Any other responses, questions? Got to wrap this up. Phil. Um, the Bible always says the meek shall inherit the earth, but. Yeah. Where can you say an example of that? Example? Yeah. I don't ever see that. <laughs> Anybody want to answer, Phil? <laughs> I don't want to push it into yeah. just the future. I mean, the easy way for the Christians to say, oh, that'll happen Wait, when the earth is restored, the meek will get it one day. But I think if you look carefully, you will see stories of real inheriting where you get it, where people who follow Jesus and give their lives away get them back in spades. And the people who grasp and grasp have very little, narrow, um, you know, the super rich in the United States, you know how the billionaire um, population keeps growing? And uh, I think now 26 people in, in the world own more than the 50% of the world, right? 26, that was the last Oxfam report. I remember a few years ago where it was 84 people owned 50, what, 50%. Anyway, um, it's now 26, like six years later. But um, 26 people own all the way, but they have very tiny lives. They don't inherit the earth. And you're going to be like, oh, that's kind of a big, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I think some of it is, is still future. God promises justice for all. But I also think that if we learn how to live extravagantly without wasting resources, live, live, extravagant love and extravagant sharing and, and party together in ways that are sustainable and that use our share, uses one earth. I think that we will inherit that earth. We're going to destroy the earth. We know it. Uh, sane, smart scientists who hate to make predictions, who are, you, they don't want to make it. They don't want to say any conclusions. That's what scientists, scientists hate to do that stuff, are saying 100 years from now, people may not exist. Now, I disagree. Yeah, I don't think that's quite true, but most human beings won't exist. So are we inheriting the earth. I, that, that's not a good answer. I wish I had thought about your question before you asked it. Yes, Robert. So, <clears throat> the challenge that I hear you posing, uh, if we want to make this practical, is how do we find right livelihood? Um, because the, the, the difficulty is um, we want to withdraw our support from this corrupt uh, uh, imperial system, but we have to somehow live yes. with that around us. Yeah. And the question is, how can we um, construct lives for ourselves that and for are, our kids and for our kids yes. um, that don't feed that system but help to help to bring about a just system? Yeah. I so agree with you. Yeah, right lives. So you got right the answer trans. to that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just I just answered your question. Right livelihood, right transportation, right waste, you know everything. Like the whole, yeah, and that's what livelihood, right lot living, right communities. I think we have to start talking about it. Right? That's the first step. Can I answer that question? Oh, good. It's, <laughs> not, actually give, it's not actually to give an answer. I would say to actually come to connect group would be one step. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite sure, even for yesterday, for all the ones that were there, we really feel like you know, the thin space of heaven and earth really yes. comes together yeah. and something new was giving birth. 
and um, and we got to the go to the nitty gritties of you know for example talk about climate change and we have some wonderful program and very able people that is going to share all the wonderful tips or just change of lifestyle and the next time we're going to have um, um, movie night and I'm going to introduce a little bit. I think all of these actually all tie up together yeah. to, to give us the, the practical creative way that is not to say what works for you might work for me but it will be creatively live my life as God given me. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Good. That's good. I've integrated. We really should say take our lives. Should we sing it that way? Yes. But it's maybe a bit more. Let's sing take my life because it starts with me. Right? It's a choice. Each of us is going to have to choose. Am I going to live lamb-shaped or beastly? Am I going to live in bed with a whore? Or am I going to live as the lamb's bride? This beautiful, strong, powerful woman who inherits the earth. 